بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وبه نستعين ونصلي ونسلم على أفضل الخلق أجمعين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد we commence by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sending blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam we ask Allah to bless him and his entire household and to bless all his companions and to bless all those who have struggled and strived to protect this deen, learn it, put it into practice, convey it to others in a way that it has got to us today. And we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for being chosen to be from amongst the followers of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And at the same time, we ask him to grant our children steadfastness to use us as well to convey the message to others. Beloved brothers and sisters, we had spoken yesterday about how the first people of Medina Munawwara had accepted Islam and we made mention of the names of six of them. Before I continue with that, it's important to make mention of the marriage of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam after the death of his wife Khadija binti Khuwailid radiallahu anha. She was the mother of all his children who were alive and she was the mother and at the same time, the one who was the pillar of support at the time of need of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when revelation first came down. So she looked after the children and she was a wife, a very big comfort at the same time. And she maintained the home in a very beautiful way. Never is there mention of a single dispute between Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Khadija binti Khuwailid radiallahu anha. So after he, her death, may Allah be pleased with her, Khawla binti Hakim, who was the wife of Uthman ibn Mad'un, radiyallahu anhu, she was noticing that the home of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is void of a female, and the children are quite small. And she suggested to him, Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, don't you want to get married? And he made mention of Khadija. And he always made, made mention of Khadija radiallahu anha so much so that he kept a good link with all her friends even later on. He used to send for them a little bit of food or he used to send for them a gift or he used to get very happy when they used to come and visit even during his time in Medina Munawwara. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from amongst those who can respect our in-laws. Today subhanallah we have people who run very far away and they don't want to know. In fact, I, to this day, don't understand why the term in law is used. That the term LAW normally refers to big problems. When you have a big issue, then you call in the lawyers and so on. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and grant us all goodness and ease. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he had a suggestion made to him by Khawla binti Hakim radiallahu anha. She said, I suggest that you get married. He says, to whom? So she said, you can marry a virgin or you can marry a non-virgin. If you would like to marry a non-virgin, I am suggesting to you to marry Sauda binti Zam'ah radiallahu anha, a very poor lady who was married already and her husband had passed away. She was one of those who had gone to Abyssinia on the Hijrah and on the return her husband had passed away and she was a person whose family were made up of mushriks she had accepted Islam at the very beginning. She was persecuted to a great degree. She had had her own children and she was from one of those who really needed protection and she really needed to be saved from the clutches of her own brothers who were mushriks. Her father was not that bad, although he was a mushrik, but his relation with her was not so bad. And she suggested, meaning Khawla binti Hakim radiallahu anha says, that is a good woman, she is a widow and you can marry her. And the other one, if you would like to marry a virgin, then you can marry the daughter of your best friend, although she is very young right now. But as was the norm at that time, this is important that we listen to this, because many people claim that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam married a child, a'udhu billah. Wallahi, we need to understand the norms of every community and society. Up to this day, you have people in the Indo-Pak subcontinent that I know about and I'm sure in other places of the world as well, whom as soon as the child is born, they say, this child we're fixing up with that child and it's done. And it's an agreement by mouth. And when they grow up nowadays, you find people breaking that. But there was a time when they never ever broke that. 
If the father said this, it was that. They were more or less married at childbirth. And later on, they only got to live together. That doesn't make them bad in any way. It was just the culture. And it still is the culture in so many places where young age, they say, okay, this one fixed up with that one. It's just that the world has progressed at the moment and communications has become so simple and easy that we tend to have a much more broader choice today. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a deeper understanding. And at the same time, we tend to be a little bit more free of the choices of our own parents. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us understanding. So there was a suggestion and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, you know what, speak to Sauda. Subhanallah, look at his choice. He had children and he had subhanallah, children to be looked after and he was looking for someone who would also be able to comfort him, be a mother and a wife at the same time. And this was the woman whom he had selected and he had chosen or he had given preference to. So what had happened? Khawla bint Hakim radiallahu anha went to Sauda. She was married to a Sakran ibn Amr before and he passed away radiallahu anhu. What a good man. And he had passed away and now Khawla bint Hakim says to Sauda, I want to give you some good news. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has sent me to you asking you in for marriage, meaning your hand in marriage. What do you have to say? She was obviously shocked. She was in awe. She couldn't believe it. She had suffered and suffered so much. The wives that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam chose were those who had suffered a lot and they were in need of protection. They were basically left more or less at the clutches of the enemy and they were being oppressed in so many ways. So she, this was a sigh of relief for her. She said, look, Alhamdulillah, meaning, yes, I am okay with it, but you need to speak to my father. Imagine the father being a non-Muslim, being one of the mushriks of Quraysh, still Sauda bint Zama'a radiallahu anha says, go and speak to my father. So when the message went to the father of this particular woman, Ummul Mu'mineen Sauda bint Zama'a radiallahu anha, who was an elderly woman, she wasn't a young girl. He was very happy. He was an old man who was a mushrik and he was one of those of Mecca, but he was happy. To him, his daughter was getting fixed in the right direction and she would be looked after by the man who shares the same belief as her. And this was something that he looked at and thereafter, subhanallah, they ended up getting married. It is reported in the 10th year of Hijrah, which was the same year that uh, Khadija bint Khawailid radiallahu anha had passed away. And Sauda bint Zama'a was such a happy woman. She looked after the children of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to a certain extent. She was within the home. She provided comfort. And she says that never ever did we have any issues or difficulties. She was in awe of this man. What a great man. She learned so much from him. She was protected from her own family members and the others who had intended to harm her. This was the marriage of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam after Khadija bint Khuwailid radiallahu anha. Now we move further and we go back to the six names of those six who had accepted Islam after coming from Medina Munawwara when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam met them at the festival. The names, we just mentioned them again so that we know we mentioned them yesterday. As'ad ibn Zurara radiyallahu anhu. These names when we hear them, wallahi, they should make our hair stand. Because these were those who sacrificed at the very beginning of Islam. They sacrificed. And they were the ones who gave their lives. And they were the ones whom Allah used to change the entire ge geopolitical situation. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. As'ad ibn Zurara radiyallahu anhu. He wasn't such an old man. He was from Khazraj. Then we have Awth ibn al-Harith and Rafi ibn Malik, Qutbah ibn Amir, Uqbah ibn Amir and Jabir ibn Abdullah. May Allah be pleased with all of them. These people when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam met them in Mina and he told them, where are you from? They said that we are from Medina Munawwara. They said Yathrib. Yathrib was the name of the place at that particular time. And what had happened is he spoke to them. Can I speak to you for a little while? Yes. I mentioned yesterday the diplomacy of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He spoke to them, told them what Quraysh was doing, told them the message, the message of Tawheed, the message of worshipping one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your maker, that's who you worship. That is the prime message that he always delivered. 
and he told them much more about Islam. They accepted it readily because amongst themselves they said, we know the Jews in Medina Munawwara always speak about life after death. They speak about heaven, they speak about hell, and they always speak about the fact that there is a prophet who is about to come to Medina. There is a prophet who is about to come and appear at the moment. His time is here. That is why we are all here, the Jews used to say. Subhanallah. So they immediately accepted the message. They were very, very happy. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave them some advice. They had left to Medina Munawwara and they were the first people who actively started talking about Islam in Medina. And they started spreading it. Remember, Al-Aws and Khazraj. These were two warring tribes that were present in Medina Munawwara. They fought so much. We made mention of the war of Bu'ath yesterday, where a lot of their leaders were killed. That was a blessing in disguise because the leaders are always worried about their chair and their leadership. The minute these leaders were killed, now there was a little bit of silence and, uh, you know, some moments of reflection and people licking their wounds and so on, counting their losses. And they happened to meet this man. And now these young men were talking about this man. They had a few friends or acquaintances from al aws as well. And they started spreading Islam. So much so that in the next Hajj season, in the next Hajj season, they came to pledge allegiance to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Twelve men, subhanallah, from amongst them five who were there the previous year. So this made seven new ones and five of those who were already there. And they spoke to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, giving him good news that Islam has taken a lot of goodness to Medina Munawwara. And Islam has come to the hearts of the people. They are more readily accepting it than the people of Mecca. One of the reasons is because they are not foreign to this whole belief in the life after death. It's not strange to them. They've been hearing it from the Jewish people and the Jews continue saying whenever they lose a war, they say, don't worry, a messenger is going to come and we have been promised that with that messenger, we will fight you and we will win in the same way that Ad and Thamud were overcome, we will overcome you. So Islam started growing. When they came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it was known as Bay'atul Aqaba al-Ula. Al-Aqaba referring to the place where the Jamara is pelted in Mina. So there where the Jamara or the pelting of Satan takes place in Mina, that is where the first allegiance was actually pledged with 12 men from Medina Munawwara. And their names are there, Alhamdulillah. We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for making it such that this was the way Islam was going to find a whole new home and a new base. And from there, it was going to grow in a way that the entire globe would change, change thereafter, subhanallah. So look, here you have the people of Quraysh persecuting their own family member. And on the other hand, you have foreigners, strangers, people who did not know him. And they are welcoming him. They pledged allegiance to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Upon what? What was this allegiance all about? The allegiance was on several items. We are going to mention six items. Because it is reported by some of those who took part in that particular allegiance that we pledged the same allegiance that later on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made the women pledge. So here, six things we are going to mention. The first one, do not engage in shirk, subhanallah. None of you, they all pledge allegiance. We will never ever worship anyone besides Allah. No act of worship rendered to anyone besides Allah, our maker. We never render an act of worship to anyone besides him, number one. Number two, we will never steal. Number three, we will never commit adultery. Number four, we will never kill, especially the killing of our own daughters, which was prevalent at the time in the Arabian Peninsula. We will never kill. Except obviously if it was required in the sense that due to the justice system, a killer was to be executed, then that was an exception. And also we will not deceive or lie. We will not deceive or lie. And we will not cheat. Deception, lies and cheating was all under one known as Bhutan. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us. We need to know as we are listening to this, that all these things we also pledged as Muslims that we won't engage in, we won't engage in. Listen to this. Then he says, 
and they pledged not to disobey the instruction of the messenger in goodness. So wherever he instructed, it was not to be disobeyed. They, they pledged this and they promised. And the Prophet ﷺ said when he pledged the allegiance with them, if you are to fulfill this pledge, for you is paradise. If you are to fulfill this pledge, for you is paradise. And if you are to break the pledge, then it is between you and Allah. And it is up to Allah whether he will punish you or forgive you. Look at the power of the words. He didn't say, if you broke the pledge, then I'm going to come and sort you out. Or it's going to be bad for me. me. He was out of the picture then. The pledge was with him. But he says, if you break it, it's between you and Allah. Today we are very quick to judge people. MashaAllah, may Allah protect us. Very quick. Someone does something, it's like as if they owe us the whole religion. So it's up to us to declare them tyrant or not. Or it's up to us to declare this person this and that. No, take it easy. SubhanAllah. Even the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not do that in a rush. He did not do it in a rush. Because a person sinning, it's between him and Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Yes, we have the right to advise. We should, we must advise, encourage, try our best. But at the same time, remember, Towards the end of that person's life, they may become saints. Towards the end of our lives, only Allah knows what will happen. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us goodness and steadfastness. So they pledged and they went back to al Madinatul Munawwara. Beautiful. They went back to Madinah Munawwara and I'm obviously cutting it a little bit short. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent to teach them in Madinah Munawwara one of his companions and a narration makes mention of someone who accompanied him. Who was this companion? Mus'ab ibn Umayr radiyallahu anhu. Remember we spoke about a man who was smelt before he was seen. Remember we spoke about a man who was so spoilt by his mother and after he accepted Islam his skin was flaking off. This was Mus'ab ibn Umayr. He had learned so much of the Quran. Every day Quran was being revealed and they were learning it and they used to find so much joy and comfort in learning the Quran. How many of us find joy and comfort in learning the Quran? How many of us have time in the day to learn the Quran? How many days go by that we haven't even tried to learn the Quran? When I say learn, we look, we looking at its wording, the recitation, the Arabic, and in our own languages to try and understand the message of our own maker. How many of us make time for that on a daily basis? This is why those were Sahaba to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from those who can read at least one verse a day, which won't take you more than five minutes. One verse a day with its meaning, wallahi, by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it will come in as a means of our blessings. And as a means of our savior, comfort, contentment, happiness in this life and in the akhirah. May Allah make us from amongst those. I'm sure we can do better than just one verse. But that one verse is a start and none of us have an excuse. We are all able to read and write. Unlike the people of Quraysh. At that time, the Arabs, they were almost all unlettered people who could neither read nor write. They only used to listen and hear and let someone who could read, read for them and so on. Subhanallah. This is why their memories were so powerful. Whenever they heard something, they memorized it word for word. Powerful memories. They were known to be from amongst those who had memorized the lineages of their animals, their camels and so on. Their horses, they knew exactly up to this day. There are Arabs who know the lineage of their horses in the rural areas within the Middle East. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us memories. So this was their sacrifice. Mus'ab ibn Umayr radiallahu anhu went to Medina Munawwara. One narration says, with him was the blind companion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abdullah ibn Ummi Maktoum radiallahu anhu. You recall the surah, Abasa wa Tawalla, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was admonished for having frowned and turned away from the blind man. That was Abdullah ibn Ummi Maktoum radiallahu anhu. He was a reciter of the Quran. He was also a muadhin of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at some stage. And he was sent to al Madinah al munawwara as well. But mention is mainly made of Musab ibn Umayr because he was the leader. He was the one who went and he taught the people for almost an entire year. The following year, just before the season of Hajj, Musab ibn Umayr radiallahu anhu returned to Madinah al munawwara And 
He spoke to Muhammad sallallahu immediately as he came, he went to Rasulullah sallallahu He says, Oh Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this is the condition in Medina Munawwara. Every single home, there is someone who's Muslim in it. Every home, there is someone who is Muslim in it. And subhanallah, it became so beautiful. There were certain incidents that had occurred that were powerful. We should be mentioning them. There was a leader of Aus whose name was Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad radiyallahu anhu. What a name. Remember that name. We are going to hear about him later on. Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad, one of the leaders of Aus. He noticed Mus'ab ibn Umair had come to Medina Munawwara and was staying at the house of As'ad ibn Zurara radiyallahu anhu. And so he tells Usaid ibn Hudayr, who was his cousin, he says, you know what? These two here, they have come to spoil the belief of our forefathers and to contaminate the minds of the people here in Medina. So go and stop them. Go and see what they're all about and stop them from what they're doing. So Usaid ibn Hudayr, later to be known as radiallahu anhu, he went to Mus'ab ibn Umayr. And he, as he was entering, As'ad ibn Zurara says, oh, this is one of the leaders of Aus. One of the leaders of Aus. So this man comes in and he says, what are you two doing? Why is it that you have come here to mess the, the mindset and what we've been doing all along and so on? Musab ibn Umair says, hang on, why don't you listen to what I have to say? And then you can make your mind up if it is palatable and if you feel you'd like to accept it, accept it. And if not, we can stop. Don't worry, we won't harm your people. So he says, what is it? So Musab ibn Umair read some Quran, told him about Islam, told him about Tawheed and not worshipping the idols, told him about Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and immediately Usaid ibn Hudayr, he bears witness. He says, you are right. This is a beautiful message. I agree with you and I also bear witness. Subhanallah, look at how many seconds it took them to turn. They came to block, to stop. It took them a second or two and they turned. Subhanallah, Usaid ibn Hudayr radiyallahu anhu, immediately he was known as. The question for us is how many of us are ready to surrender when we hear every day this is right this is wrong this is the way it should be this is the way we wait sometimes in some cases nowadays that the globe is a small little village people wait for loopholes you know when someone says interest is haram we'll start googling they call it sheikh google mashallah start googling who says it's not when we find the fatwa we quickly stick to it i found something else that's the attitude nowadays we quickly go and use sheikh google in order to justify what we want to do rather than surrendering to it come on it says qala allahu wa qala rasul allah and his messenger have said this the game is over everything stops at that point subhanallah may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from those who can surrender because remember the only way that we can achieve success is to follow the command of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so usaid ibn hudayr goes back to sa'ad ibn mu'ad who was waiting for him and he says what did you do he says no i went and their message is good i've heard it and i accept what do you mean how can you do that no they spoke about this and this Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad says no, he got up and he also went to Mus'ab ibn Umayr. Do you know what? Exactly the same thing happened to him, what happened to Usaid ibn Hudayr moments earlier. Amazing. Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad radiallahu anhu, he was one of the leaders of Aus, and he went to Mus'ab ibn Umayr telling him, what are you doing here? He says, hang on, listen to me. If you can accept it, you will. If not, we stop. And when he presented the message, Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad accepted the message. Radiyallahu anhu. Look at how beautifully Islam was being welcomed in one place. And yet where it was born, it was being kicked out from. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. I want to pause here for a moment. And I want to make mention of a verse of the Quran that always brings tears to my eyes. Because it reminds me of what I've just said moments ago. Allah says, If you turn away, we will replace you with others who will not be like you. Clear verse. So Allah is telling us, Ya ayyuhannasu antumul fuqara'u ilallah. 
Wallahu huwa al-ghaniyul hamid. Oh people, you are the ones who are in desperate need of Allah. Allah is independent. He doesn't need you at all. So if you do not want to obey Allah's instruction, He will replace you with others who will obey His instructions. And then who would have lost out? You, no one else. This is the message to us. And this is why I say, my sisters, if you don't want to cover, Allah doesn't lose anything. Another 10 will cover because of your uncovering. And if we don't want to stop listening to that, which is detrimental to the ears in terms of music and so on, it's not like Allah is going to be harmed by it. There will be others who will have stopped because of our non-stopping attitude. And we will have lost out. So remember, if we don't read Salah, there are others who will be reading Salah in great numbers, in a more beautiful way. We will be at loss, not, not Allah. Others would have gained. So don't miss the boat. We call ourselves Muslims. A Muslim is one who surrenders. Why should we not surrender then when we call ourselves surrenderers to the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? May Allah make us steadfast. May He make us from those who realize and understand. Look at this. The people of Mecca were replaced by the people of Medina Munawwara. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness and may He grant us a lesson. Experience the power of uninterrupted viewing with our ad free app One Islam TV, allowing you to connect deeply with the content. Explore the rich teachings of Islam and strengthen your faith through our regular new content. Download the One Islam TV app now. Ooh.